Good evening. My name is Rob Munir, and I'm the Vice President for Marine Facilities and Operations at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Welcome to session two of Rising Tides Facing the Future. The first session this afternoon, resiliency through policy focused on the role of government at all levels from federal to local and preparing for a future of rising sea levels and more frequent and significant storm impacts. We heard from Senator from Congressman Bill Keating. We heard from uh, State Senator Sue Moran. We heard from uh, S Select Board Chairperson uh, Megan English Braga. Uh, we heard from the Executive Director of the Cape Cod Commission, uh, Christy Senatori. And we heard from USGS uh, Regional Director Rob Thieler. And they provided uh, a great and lively discussion about the role of government. And I'd say there were a few main themes that we took away from that. that the, the, the government has to provide leadership and they have to provide good information, and that is the science. And success in both of these areas is dependent upon engaging the public and communicating the messages in a way that enables action. If you weren't able to listen to this first session, uh, it will be uh, recorded and available on the HUI website. Tonight's session is called A Science Community Prepares and focuses on Woods Hole as a case study for both the problem and what we can anticipate the impacts of sea level rise will be for the rest of the century and the solution how a community can work towards mitigation and resiliency while still retaining the essence of place. For the solution, and I'll give you part of the punchline, communities need to unite and work together. And this, re this event is the result of a partnership between HUI, the Marine Biological Laboratory, and the Northeast Fisheries Science Center of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, three world-class oceanographic institutions located on a half mile stretch of aptly named Water Street in Woods Hole. And while each institution has its own self-interests, we realize that better outcomes could be achieved by working together. As leaders in climate change research, we also felt an obligation to lead and share what was learned in this process with our neighbors and the community at large. Of course, there is a certain irony that the world leaders in climate change are ourselves at risk of its impacts, but that speaks to the need for oceanographic institutions to have waterfront facilities that provide access to the sea to do their work. And our time horizons are long. October is HUI's 90th birthday, and MBL and NOAA Fisheries have been around for well over 100 years. So looking forward until the end of the 21st century, for us, is business as usual. The statement of the problem will be presented by Kirk Bosma of the Woods Hole Group Consulting Firm. HUI MBL and NOAA Fisheries recognize Woods Hole Group as a leader in modeling the impacts of climate change, and in particular sea level rise, and together engage them to do an in-depth study of Woods Hole. Kirk will present a high-level overview of the results of this study, and he will be followed by a panel consisting of representatives from HUI, MBL, NOAA Fisheries, as well as a Woods Hole business leader and resident. Kirk is a senior coastal engineer and innovation director at the Woods Hole Group, He's an expert in climate change and resilient design, specializing in coastal engineering adaptations to foster urban and coastal rural resiliency. He is also a registered professional engineer. Woods Hole Group has performed vulnerability assessment and resiliency planning studies throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, including Falmouth. I'm pleased to introduce Kirk Bosma. Thanks, Rob. Um, excited to be here tonight. Um, looking forward to talking a little bit about Woods Hole Village and some of the uh, work that we've done here. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with Woods Hole Group if you're in Falmouth. We've done a lot of presentations recently <laughs> looking at climate change impacts to the town of Falmouth. Most recently last week, my colleague Lisa Duke, who I worked with on the Surf Drive study, looked in and kind of explored what the future may hold for the, the Surf Drive area. Um, so some of this might be familiar to you. Um, we're going to start to look at some of the results that maybe apply directly to Woods Hole Village and look a little bit at the, the climate change and um, vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan for, for this specific area within Falmouth. Next slide. So 
start by saying, you know, we have a, here we have a bird's eye view of, of kind of the Woods Hole area. And one thing besides the beauty of it that you notice right off the bat is uh, the lower elevation, right? So Woods Hole is sitting kind of a little bit lower than, than the rest of Falmouth. And, and so it's not surprising that there are some vulnerabilities in the same wonderful aspects of, of Woods Hole that connects them to the water, that connects them to the sea, also starts to become a potential issue when you think about rising sea levels and climate change. And so looking and digging into that a little bit, questions start getting asked. And these are the same types of questions we get from a lot of different towns and communities, which is what's the probability of flooding? Uh, you know, how is it gonna occur? How often is it gonna occur? What really is vulnerable and, and how do I start building prioritizations to, to this, this changing climate? And then ultimately, what, what is the plan? What should we do? Next slide. So a little bit about where this data comes from, um, just to set the stage. So this originally started with looking at the central artery tunnel system up in Boston. And there's a lot of climate change data out there. Um, a lot of it uses very simplistic approaches um, uh, as a first order cut. Uh, typically there's this bathtub approach that uh, floods water up to a certain elevation. This is an example kind of in Boston Harbor of a typical bathtub approach. You go back one, water surface elevation gets raised up to about 12 feet and 88. That's a combined storm surge with sea level rise. You can see what floods, it's a flat water surface elevation like you'd get in a bathtub. But if you actually dynamically simulate that, Next slide. You can get a drastically different picture of what might happen with water levels in and around the city. Why is that? Because when you have a storm, it's not a flat water surface elevation, right? You have waves, you have winds, you have things blowing in different directions. So we get a, an actually a, a two to three foot higher water surface elevation along that south shore area there because the, a nor'easter comes in and blows water in that area. You get spatial variations in where water may, may be pushed, where water may flow. And, and so we said, what you really need to understand, especially when you're looking at critical infrastructure, is the dynamic nature of water movement. Uh, similar to a case, if you fill up your bathtub at home, it's flat, right? That's okay if you're just looking at a sunny day condition. But if you have a hurricane or a tropical storm or a east, nor'easter that comes through, and, I, and following that analogy, if I take my four-year-old son and put him in the bathtub, Hurricane Jackson, it's no longer a flat water surface elevation, right? So that's what, was needed here. Next slide. So with the support of Mass DOT and Coastal Zone Management, we started developing first for Boston Harbor and then for the entire state of Massachusetts, what we call the Massachusetts Coast Flood Risk Model. It's a dynamic model that incorporates a lot of the processes that actually go into climate change and, and, and the evolution. And it produces more information than just are you wet or not. Uh, it gives you duration of flooding, probabilities of flooding, what the waves are doing, what the winds are doing. And these are the data that have become the state standard. We use those in Falmouth, we use those in Gloucester, we use those in Boston, and now we're applying them to Woods Hole. Next slide. Just real quickly, what makes some of this, this science and this, this modeling unique is it's very high resolution. So this is just a grid of, of the Boston area. You can see every little square there in that puzzle piece we calculate water surface elevation, velocities, waves, um, and it gets down to basically five to 10 feet in, in high, highly urbanized areas. So we're, we're getting street level flooding, we're getting interaction with the, the um, landscape at a very, very high resolution. Next slide. We also look at, the model is also capable of a couple other things. So it does time variable wave run up and overtopping. So one of the key elements in, in, in really looking at storms is when waves hit a structure, throw water over the top of the structure and flow inland. That's dynamically included in the model, which is a, is a very important part of, of um, especially coastal based communities and what might happen when waves impact the shoreline. And then we also have upgraded the shoreline quite significantly from MassGIS and that's what's shown in the lower panel there. For selecting sea level rise, um, you can see the chart there. There's a wide distribution of potential sea level rise conditions that, that can occur. Um, we selected a certain point on the curve that corresponds with kind of business as usual. That's the uh, regional concentration pathway of 8.5. 
Um, so those little X's on the chart there fall. They're not the most extreme. Um, they're not the, the low. They're, they're something that we consider as probably a conservative but reasonable approach to looking at sea level rise. And what we, we do is we select those and we wanted them higher rather than lower because that allows us to bracket the risk, right? So if you look at that chart right there, if you really think that a, uh, a potential lower projection is occurring, you just have a sliding time scale of, of potential impact, right? So 2030 in our model might become 2050 if you follow a lower regional concentration pathway or emission scenario. Next slide. The other piece of what we do is we use a Monte Carlo approach. So we're simulating hundreds, thousands of different storms, both extra tropical, tropical conditions to basically understand what the probabilistic distribution of risk is for an area. Um, this is just an example of the number of, of storms that we simulated for, for the Boston project and, and also then eventually expanded that for the rest of the coastline. These models are calibrated to historic storms. So the, the figure on the left shows the model comparison to the blizzard of 78, where we want to get that peak water surface elevation right. So that red dashed line on top of the chart is the peak water surface elevation. Our blue is the model results through time. And we, we hit that peak water surface elevation right. So we have a calibrated model that simulates thousands and thousands of storms that allows you to understand what your probabilistic risk is going forward. The other thing is those storms change through time. So we have an evolution of the intensity and frequency, frequency of tropical storms, how they, they hit the, the region. Next slide. What that does is it produces, and I just am showing Boston as an example here, a different type of map. Um, it provides a coastal flood exceedance probability. And what that is, is a, pro a chance that you may be flooded. So the different colors on the map indicate your percent probability when a storm comes through under that time horizon that you may get wet. So in this case, if you look at the darker green scenario, that would be a 2% chance. So if a storm comes in in present day, that area on the map shows a 2% chance of flooding. So we can look at the spatial variability of risk, but we can also look at the temporal variability of risk. So as we jump forward in time, you can see we looked at the 2030 conditions in Boston, and then the 2070 conditions in Boston and how your risk profile, both in terms of space and time is changing. That allows you to start prioritizing where you might need to take actions. Next slide. So that's the data that we then applied. We did, we have that developed for the entire state of Massachusetts. Again, it's the state standard. It's been used everywhere. It's what's being applied for all the vulnerability assessments and all the climate actions and frankly, all the designs that are currently happening across the state. Um, for Woods Hole, uh, remember what we saw when we started. It's low. <laughs> um, the first thing I'm going to show you is the results from MCFRM in terms of just sunny day tide conditions. So present day here, we jump forward to 2030, which is what you're looking at here, and now 2050. There's an expansion of where just normal tides are going to be if you look at the projected sea level rise going forward in time. And then we're at 2070 in this case. So you start to see flooding that goes from Challenger Drive in 2030 to Woods Hole Park in 2050 to flow down Gardner Road in 2070 near Bigelow Street. Um, eventually you get connections through Stony Beach. Um, the aquarium is, would be um, inundated during normal tidal conditions. So this is what would happen during during sunny day conditions. You go to the next set of slides. Now we're, we're focused on what might happen if you combine that sea level rise dynamically with, with storm conditions that come through. And this isn't that surprising at first, um, considering some of the, if you were here in the first session, you saw some of the historical flooding information that happened during Hurricane Carol, that happened during the no name storm, that even happened when, during the King Tides in, in 2019. And so there's a pretty significant risk level. So, you know, a 50% chance on this, this uh, map here basically means there's a 50% chance of flooding in that specific area if you have a storm come through um, under that time horizon. So if you look at 2030, there's a pretty large area that would be suspected to be inundated. And if you're at a 50% level, just like you check the weather in the morning, 
you're probably, if for rain, you're probably gonna grab an umbrella or a raincoat. Well, that's the situation you start to get in. Um, this isn't set in stone, right? There's a, there's a large variety of sea level rise conditions and projections that, that occur. And, and a lot of times people look at this and start to think about you know, despair, what can we do? Um, I'm here to say that it's not all as bad as it looks, right? This is projections, this isn't, isn't what actually is gonna happen. And there are things you can start to do. There are things you can start to think about. Um, an opportunity to change your relationship with a waterfront, to, to reimagine the waterfront and, and still save the connection with people in the water. Next slide. So, we take that information, the probability of flooding, and that has information on depths and waves and all the physical processes that go along with it. And then we start to cross that with the assets in and around the village of Woods Hole. And this, could, this figure here is showing the, the three institutions assets. Um, and what we're trying to measure here is risk. So risk is actually a measure of the consequence of the inundation versus the probability of the inundation. So I told you about the probability of inundation. If the consequence of that asset getting wet is a really high risk, high, high problem, you start to trend towards the red portion of that matrix there. Um, so the scores, which look at things like cost of damage, service loss, duration, and extent of flooding are shown over there for the assets. And those were developed um, collaboratively with the various institutions to say that yeah, this particular asset has a really, really high consequence. So the pinker values there, the redder values indicate high consequence. If those get flooded, we have some issues. Blue, less so. So something like Stony Beach, if it floods, probably isn't a huge consequence. Next slide. So now we cross that consequence of flooding with the probability of flooding that we have from the model and we start to get the overall risk or vulnerability. And so this is present day risk, a lot of green, low consequence because the probability of flooding isn't as high. If we go forward in time and look at 2030, things start to evolve a little bit. You go forward to 2050, now you're starting to see some higher consequences because now the probability of flooding is, is increasing in certain areas. If you go to 2070, you start to see where the prioritization process might start to play out because those are very critical assets that start to have a higher risk tolerance level. Next slide. So what are we, what are we going to do about this? Um, so that's how the data, where the data comes from, how the data is applied. Um, but we don't want to just stop there and say, okay, you guys are on your own. Figure, figure out what you're going to do. We, we, we're providing some potential answers here. And we're looking at three levels of adaptations. We're looking at asset specific, so what that means is looking specifically at a particular building, a particular structure, a particular element of, of the neighborhood and saying, here's what you could do to make that more resilient. Um, we're looking at parcel level, which looks at kind of a community and I'll get into that in a second. And then we're looking at the community based level. Um, one thing I wanna just point out about what these adaptations are, they're, they're concepts and ideas. These are not designs, these are not final recommendations. They're intended to keep the, to kind of get the creative juices flowing, think about education, ask when actions should be considered, when they should not be considered, um, and they can be assembled in different ways. So we are, I'm gonna present some ideas on how they can be assembled, um, but that doesn't mean they all have to follow this framework I'm presenting. Everything we're presenting is very flexible, very adaptive. So for example, in, in for this particular state, marine operations in Pafio, you can see that the curves there, the coastal flood exceedance probabilities and how those evolve through time. The low point of that particular asset is the bulkhead. And so maybe it's simply sealing that bulkhead or providing some flood proofing at the early levels and, and knowing when to do that, when the risk becomes intolerable. So at 2050, there's a 10% risk that might happen. Next slide. If you start to consider the parcel level solutions, this is looking at um, some of the Hui buildings uh, in the area right near the Island Dock. And so how we are evaluating those through time. So the adaptations don't all have to happen today. They're phased in. They're based on actual monitoring of what the sea level is, is gonna be doing in time. And 
everything here is modular. So it's, it's built to be flexible, expand in the future as climate actually changes, as sea level rise increases and changes. So in this particular case, we're looking at modular flood walls around the buildings with deployable flood barriers, self-rising tide gates. I'm not gonna get into all the details, but essentially protecting those particular buildings. Next slide. And then we looked at kind of more of the community level. And these tend to be the solutions and the, the, the approaches that make the most sense because it involves people working together that are the most cost effective and they provide regional level solutions. And we, we essentially looked at three different themes. The first theme is, is protect, which emphasizes protection and maintenance of infrastructure and current usage, right? So we're trying to maintain the way Woods Hole Village operates today. Um, and what that figure there shows is a lot of elevation, right? Elevations at the edge. So that means a lot of cases berms, a lot of cases seawalls, modular bulkheads, deployable barriers, elevated floating docks, terraces, green spaces to basically um, keep the water out at least as much as possible. And you're not gonna do that to the every single storm event, but basically maintain operations. And so that would be the protect-based theme. Go to the next theme, it's, it's the migrate theme. And that kind of balances uses and needs with increased costs and, and threats going forward. You saw the maps, the threats are, are there. And so this looks at the exposure horizons through time and talks about a managed kind of migration or managed retreat of Woods Hole. That doesn't mean it has to happen today. Right? We're monitoring what's actually happening, but it's, it lays out the frame for, framework for when things may have to happen, when moving or migration might need to occur, and trying to keep a central core to Woods Hole Village that would maintain and, and stay available through time as you, as you go forward in, in the climate uh, horizons. And the last theme that we're presenting is, is a transformational theme. And transformation really emphasizes the balance of the current use with a vision of potential transformation of future flood prone areas. Um, and so this really looks at re-envisioning what Woods Hole is, but keeping that epicenter of oceanographic marine research where you're actually involved, you know, inviting climate change and becoming um, more ingrained with the sea itself. So this, this involves creation of a new harbor in the middle where, where the tides are going to come in. We're not going to be able to keep those out. That's a, you know, it's going to come in from the north, a new inlet, an entrance into this new harbor. Um, we're not asking people to move, to, to, to migrate away, but there would be living with water places uh, where, you know, we're keeping the water out during sunny days, but it's going to come in during storms. And so it would be a retreat and return type approach in those areas. And then at the center of the whole area, there's this spine of Water Street and, and the, the docks and higher areas that would be protected even during a storm event. So it's, it's a mix of various solutions where you're living with water, you're, you're allowing some um, natural resources, you see the salt marsh migration areas, but at the core, you're still going to have this research focused community and village where you still have the, the, the infrastructure there that, that's protected during those storm events. It's just a much more focused area. Um, so those are just, again, I'd, I'd say you can mix and match these. These are just different types of solutions that you can apply. They're not formalized design. Again, it's just to think about that. And all these ideas are based on being prepared being planned and thinking forward um, in the process. Thank you very much, Kirk. I really appreciate those uh, comments, uh, a little bit sobering, but I also appreciate the fact that you uh, have some solutions there. Uh, I would like to invite the audience to, uh, we have a few minutes for questions for Kirk before we move on to the panel. I'd like the audience to uh, participate. You use the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen and uh, not the chat button. So if you're interested in asking Kirk a, quick, a question, please do. And uh, uh, Kirk, I do appreciate the fact that you use 38 Water Street as uh, one of your examples, that being where my office is. 
thank you for that. Uh, I, I, I have a, a couple of questions that are pending here. Uh, one is, um, I'm curious about, you know, you've uh, been doing this across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and I'm interested to get your uh, perspective on how Falmouth and Woods Hole is doing with respect to planning versus other communities that you've um, uh, been doing the same type of uh, study for? Sure. So we've been doing it not just across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but I can also tie in other places we're doing it in, in Florida, the Gulf Coast. Um, so we're not we haven't been restricted to doing this model and this approach just in, in Massachusetts. Um, I will say Massachusetts in general, even compared to New York, is ahead. So they, they are definitely ahead of the curve in terms of looking at climate change, means focused, and again, thinking about it from a, a plan, monitor, prepare type perspective. Um, there are other uh, communities in the Commonwealth that probably are ahead of Falmouth and ahead of, of Woods Hole, Cambridge, Boston being a couple. Uh, we've done a lot. We've been involved with all the Climate Ready Boston projects. They're using these same data. Um, they've actually had implementation work done. So they've gone through this process, prioritized. All of Climate Ready Boston work is based on the prioritized probabilistic results that I showed today. So they know where to identify and where their kind of clear and present danger is and where they can wait and see. And that's the approach they've taken. So they've been through the design, they've done some implementation. Um, Cambridge has a very, very detailed climate assessment plan that uses a lot of our, our data and our work. But Falmouth has, has caught up quickly. Um, they have done a lot in a very, very short time. It's very, very impressive. The the concentration they've put on it, the education and smarts, I would say, of the people in, in the Falmouth area is, is really helpful in making things move forward in a very quick way. Yeah, thanks. Um, another question here is uh, about uh, your analysis is based on major storms plus sea level rise. How much less would the adaptation be if you just designed for sea level rise only? We already deal with periodic storms on an episodic basis. And that question uh, it sort of brings to mind some conversations I've had with the, with the Dutch who are you know, uh, pretty experienced in handling water uh, for centuries, as a matter of fact. Uh, and they do take a, an approach similar to the, this question about uh, being willing to accept a certain amount of uh, inundation or storm uh, impacts. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I'd start by saying I'm 100% I'm Dutch. I don't know if you knew that, but I'm 100% I'm Dutch. Um, my grandfather came over from, from Holland, uh, the Friesland par portion of the Netherlands. Um, maybe that's why I'm in this. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, so I did present kind of the normal title, just sea level rise conditions. Those are those sunny day conditions. The designs that I'm presenting certainly integrate that into the thing. So the, for example, the transform solution um, focuses kind of on where sea level rise is going to have the biggest impact in kind of living with the storms, right? Not all the storms, but you know, you're going to accept kind of the really bad episodic storms. So living with water, those type of approaches, the transformation approach says, hey, we're, we can't stop sea level rise completely. We're going to have to deal with that and we can manage the storms. Um, and then if you were just talking about sea level rise, you know, alone, that kind of slides your time frame of adaptation actions out further, right? So if you're willing to accept more risk, 10% versus 1%, you can wait longer and see what actually happens with one. So uh, there's a question about cost here, and uh, it's a very open-ended one. What is the cost? And I'm going to uh, actually translate that to... Uh, you mentioned that some of the communities you've worked with, Cambridge in particular, I think was one, has, has already started investing in some of the adaptation uh, efforts and uh, protection efforts. Where are they getting the funds to do that? Yeah, so I mean, I can give you an example that's really applicable in Duxbury, Massachusetts. So we went through this same process, really focused on, on Duxbury Beach. But through CZM resiliency grants and MVP action grants, they actually funded the study, the design and permitting, 
and the actual construction of adaptations. In this case, it was a nature-based adaptation. Um, and they were funded, they have a match, but they were funded fully through the state-based grants to start building adaptations. Boston has some similar projects. Um, there, uh, there is a lot of grant-based money out there that towns can implement once they become part of the MVP program, or even if they're not, <laughs> to start to really think about how to adapt and, and build climate change resiliency. Um, in terms of cost, I mean, that's something we typically do provide. We did provide that for the town of Falmouth on all their adaptations. It's something we have to talk a little bit more about next steps, I think, for Woods Hole Village, per se. Um, but, I mean, you would see similar things of what we've done if you look at the surf drive results, because that has costs. And what we really, really like to talk about is dynamic adaptation pathways that really help plan out the most cost-effective way to take all these ideas and, and figure out how to apply them through time. Right, yeah, and of course those are our dollar costs and there's other types of costs that, uh, uh, you know, people have to change their behaviors, people have to uh, have to move. Uh, in some right. Cases, they're migrating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We've got time for one more, we've got, oh, go ahead, Kurt. Yeah, well, it's not always about moving. I just wanna point out, so a lot of times it's, it's changing their behavior the way they think about it, right? So. In some cases, it might be you can stay there, but you're, you're not going to have a grass yard anymore. It might be a salt marsh, right? And you, you're, you, know, you, can, you can be that way. And it's just a different mindset, a different way of thinking. And, and again, I like to pitch the opportunity. It's an opportunity for connecting with water in maybe a different way. We've got time for one more question uh, before we move to the panel. And uh, the question is, is it possible for the probabilities of inundation to reduce significantly if there is a more dramatic global effort to reduce the emissions, or is it too late? And this question actually came up in the afternoon session, uh, that, and Rob Thieler had to address that. But we'll, we'll give that one to you because it's, it's on a lot of people's minds. Yeah, so, you know, in terms of, and, and Rob answered it the same way I would, which is, you know, the ball is sort of rolling down the hill, so to speak, in terms of sea level rise. There's been enough done and, and enough changes in the difference between the heat of the, the ocean and the heat in the, the atmosphere that sea level rise is one of the most um, certain climate change factors that is likely to occur. Um, I'm sure that it, it could be slowed to a certain extent, but from my perspective, it's very wise to plan for what we might be facing here in terms of sea level rise. I, I always want to emphasize, it. of course, it's great to, to reduce emissions and do that, but sea level rise and the way that it's kind of actually been observed over the last 10 years or so, we've really seen quite a extensive acceleration in that, that rate. Um, so in some respects, it's, it's, you know, the ball is rolling down the hill in terms of sea level rise. Right, yeah. Rob's reference was it's baked in. Yeah. Yep. And then and now it's down to behavior. Hey, Kirk, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. That was uh, really informative and, uh, and thanks for participating tonight. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So I'd like to uh, introduce Leslie Ann McGee. Uh, she's going to moderate the panel. Uh, Leslie Ann is the deputy, deputy director of the Center for Marine Robotics uh, here at Huey, and she's also the project manager for our waterfront development project. So she's literally knee deep in the question of sea level rise in Woods Hole. So I'd like to turn it over to Leslie Ann. Thanks, Rob. I really appreciate the introduction. Um, and Kirk, thank you again for your presentation. Um, for those of you who are interested, I did see in the Q&A uh, the report is under review that Woods Hole Group has uh, completed on behalf of three institutions. Uh, and we uh, have plans to make that available on or before October 15th. So uh, I think we'll take the action on our end to inform uh, the participants of this event um, when that report um, becomes available. Again, as Rob said, I am the assistant director of the consortium now called for marine robotics at Woods Hole Oceanographic. Uh, I'm very excited to be here, and I have the great pleasure of uh, working with Rob and his team uh, to really usher in uh, the next generation waterfront complex um, at Woods Hole. 
uh, for Hui, and Rob's going to talk a little bit about that uh, in his um, in his part of this panel. So um, wanted to know if we could start the um, video on my end. So um, again, my name is Leslie Ann McGee, and I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, I do have the pleasure of managing uh, what we're calling the Seawater Project for Hui, which really does envision a 21st century adaptable and innovative waterfront complex. And as part of this work, it's imperative that we understand the science, the threats, the opportunities that climate change will present not only to our, our institution, but also our community. Just as we study symbiosis in the ocean environment at our institutions, Hui and the large institutions that are located in Woods Hole have a wonderfully vibrant and needy relationship with the Woods Hole and greater Falmouth and Cape Cod communities. As you know, since 1871, with the establishment of the US Commission on Fish and Fisheries, now called NOAA Fisheries, Woods Hole has been an epicenter of fisheries, ocean science, and environmental research. Scientists were drawn to waters kept clean and clear by strong local currents and to the deep water anchorages perfect for research vessels and to the central location midway along the most heavily fish stretches of New England. Today, Woods Hole is the site of several famous marine science institutions, including HUI, the MBL, NOAA's Northeast Fishery Science Center, the Woods Hole Research Center, uh, the Woods Hole Science Aquarium, a USGS Coastal and Marine Geology Center, and the home of the campus of the Sea Education Association. It's also the site of the United States Coast Guard sector, southeastern New England, and the Steamship Authority route between ferry between Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard. And is surrounded, I might note, by a vibrant maritime and technology economy. Um, Woods Hole and, and the institutions here um, have spun out a number of organizations and also have uh, had an influence on a number of organizations being developed. So it's really an ecosystem. But as you know, this globally important village is threatened. The NOAA tidal gauge at Woods Hole has recorded an increase in mean sea level rise of almost three millimeters annually based on a mean sea level data from 1932 to 2019. And you saw some of that data from Kirk. This really equates to approximately 10 inches of mean sea level rise over the last 87 years. And going forward, as, as uh, Kirk mentioned, the Massachusetts Coastal Flood Risk Model projects that future mean high, high water elevations for Woods Hole is in the plus 1.25 feet by 2030, plus 2.5 feet by 2050, and plus four feet by 2070. But of course, as many of you know, that the uncertainty for these projections increases substantially as you reach past the immediate future. These projections indicate tidal interference with much of Woods Hole in the near future, and climate change is expected to bring more frequent and more intense coastal storms to the region. As Kirk just said, our, our preliminary vulnerability assessment indicates that we have approximately 25% probability of contact with storm surge based on current conditions. And that probability could increase approximately 70% in the next decade. We wanted to show you these pictures uh, that you're seeing right now because we want you and, uh, to really understand what Woods Hole is. And as many of you know, it's a special place. It's steeped in history, driven by curiosity, uh, we have an unparalleled focus on the oceans. We are renowned for our contributions. We are a significant contributor to society and the economy. We are where everyone wants to visit. It is the pinnacle of many careers. It's humble in its daily life, surprisingly. It's fun and community driven. It's a launch pad for our Earth's future. And it's an access node to exploring the planet and other parts of the universe. It is exciting the next generation. And it's essential to prepare for and, and ensure its continuity. The panel here will present several different perspectives and will demonstrate how much we have in common and how we are all in this together. So I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. Um, and I'm going to start with Paul Spear. Um, Paul is the Chief Operating Officer of MBL. Uh, he's been there since 2014. Um, prior to that, he was the president of CNA, which is a Navy R&D center in Washington, D.C. He's a 1984 graduate of the Joint Program in Oceanography with a research focus on coastal, coastal tidal processes. Nicole Cabana uh, is a, the deputy director of NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Center. And I don't know if no, uh, Nicole knows this, but I actually was stationed at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center from 2000 to 2007 when I was working for the New England Fishery Management Council. So I got seven and a half years of in-depth look of what goes on in there and it's, it's incredible. Um, Nicole is a retired NOAA Corps officer um, and prior to becoming deputy director, she spent many years supporting uh, Northeast Fisheries Science Center work at sea, in the air and underwater. And she's a pilot and 
she can tell you some of her stories if you want to connect with her some other time. Um, Rob Munier, our very own, is the Vice President of Marine Operations at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He came to Huey in uh, 2010 from Tyco Telecommunications after a 30-year career in ocean engineering. He's worked on cable systems for telecommunications, oil and gas exploration, ocean observing, military applications, ocean energy, and oceanographic research. And last but certainly not least is our good friend Beth Colt. Beth has worked in Woods Hole since 2008, where she owns and operates the Woods Hole Inn and the Quicks, Hole, Quicks Holes restaurants, which by the way, Beth, the Quicks Hole talkery is like, oh, it's just awesome. Um, she's here in her role as chair of the Woods Hole Business Association, on which she has served as a volunteer for over a decade. So that is our panel tonight, and I'm going to turn it over to Paul Spear. Um, what I'm hoping our panelists will do is talk a little bit about their institutions, um, about the threats and opportunities that they see given the, um, given the analysis that we've done and some uh, hopefully very uh, positive and futuristic look at how uh, we're all in this together and we're all gonna be working together. And of course, uh, Beth has a wonderful vantage point um, about that symbiotic relationship um, of our institutions with the Woods Hole Business and Community and the Business Association. So with that, I will turn it over to Paul. While our panelists are um, getting queued up and are speaking, I would remind you to put your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat box, and we will um, hopefully get to a lot of your questions after folks uh, chat with us. So, Paul, take it away. Thanks, Leslie, and good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us here. Um, I suspect that many of you, or perhaps uh, most of you attending this symposium are familiar with the MBL, but for those who are not, let me just give you a few, a few bullets about it and you can see right there a great view of our campus uh, from the sound um, back up into the uh, residential neighborhoods um, beautifully surrounded by water uh, and uh, if you were to look back to the north you'd see our stony beach and if you could look over those buildings right on the sound you'd see our beautiful waterfront park both public access areas um, for visitors and the uh, residents of the of woods hole so the MBL is a private uh, nonprofit organization dedicated to scientific discovery by exploring fundamental biology, understanding biodiversity in the environment, and informing the human condition through research and education. The MBL has been around for a long time. We were established in 1888, and we affiliated with the University of Chicago in 2013. The MBL is well known for its advanced graduate training courses, which annually draw hundreds of students and faculty from across the country and around the world, and as well for the large number of scientists who annually come to the MBL to collaborate with colleagues from around the country and the world, as well as with our own resident year-round scientific program. And I should note that those collaborations have included the work of 58 Nobel Prize winners over the years. The location of the MBL in Woods Hole is a deliberate choice. There is unusual diversity in marine organisms in this region because of the Cape's location between two biogeographical subdivisions. And access to that diversity has fueled important advances in fundamental biology throughout the history of the laboratory. For a number of reasons, our location along the water's edge in the village of Woods Hole is key to what we do. We really do not have any realistic options for moving our major research and educational facilities from the village at this time, and you can see that there's a considerable number packed into that very small space there. As a result, uh, successfully managing the long-term impacts of sea level rise and storm-induced coastal flooding is key to our future. And if you'll recall from Kirk's um, uh, picture, if you could sort of picture that in your mind's eye, um, and you remember those reddish kind of buildings, we had perhaps more than our fair share of them. So this is a real, uh, this is a real concern for us. Interestingly, and perhaps somewhat ironically, um, the MBL's Ecosystem Center has been responsible for managing a long-term ecological research site at Plum Island in Massachusetts, and specifically looking at how coastal marsh and barrier island systems are being affected by climate change. And here we are on our campus in the same boat, so to speak. I think one important thing to note is that although the major impacts of climate change in the coastal zone may still seem a ways off to some, we at the MBL are already dealing with one primary leading indicator, and that is the cost of insuring our property and buying flood insurance. 
with most of our campus in the FEMA's 100 year flood zone, the MBL is now seeing steep and problematic year on year increases in its insurance. And that's not because we've recently experienced any losses, but because nationally, the property insurance market is dealing with substantial losses on an annual basis from major disasters that we're all aware of, huge, large tropical storms and huge fires. And these things arguably have links to climate change and, that, and they promise to get much worse over time. So several years ago, we began to think in some detail about the issue of sea level rise and the vulnerability of our campus to flooding. And we began to focus, happily enough, looking at the results of the analysis of the Woods Hole Group on the areas right along Eel Pond. And I want to just note one, I just want to have one um, uh, slide, this next slide put up for a second. So here's a view of one building on our campus that's subsequently been replaced, obviously. Um, this is the 1938 hurricane, and we're looking out over Eel Pond. Um, the building that replaced this now has all its building systems up above that water level and a major uh, lab that we have next to it called the Marine Resource Center is in the same place. But this gives you an idea of the kind of challenge that we could face. If we go back to the, the preceding slide. So um, the perspective that we've taken, that we began to take is to look at some of our key facilities right along Eel Pond, which we know to be one of the uh, the probably our vulnerable areas and to uh, focus on buildings because they're important since that specific location and the two that are of most importance are Lilly Laboratory which is that big brick building that you sort of see sitting there with an L shape and then if you move up a little ways towards the bottom of the screen you see a large building complex which is the Swope Conference Center. Um, they're particularly vulnerable because their building systems all sit at the lowest level of the building. So our focus has been on, initial focus has been on redesign, renovations, and, and then finding the requisite funding to go after those issues, to move that, that, that equipment up and out of the flood zone so that the buildings can remain operational after a flood. Effectively, we, we have been focused on what it takes to harden specific buildings. And we have conceptual designs for Lilly and begun thinking on working on one for SWO. The funding requirements for this, however, as you can might imagine are challenging. And so we've also begun thinking about possible lower cost engineering solutions. The timing of this particular study effort and the collaboration with the two other institutions, as well as the town of Falmouth, is an important step forward from our perspective. First, it makes sense to coordinate our efforts with our local colleagues. And by that, I should also include the business community and our residential neighborhoods as well. And second, of course, anything we do on our campus that is disconnected from Falmouth's long-term view of potential Woods Hole Village solutions ultimately will not work. We could spend a lot of time, effort, and money, for example, uh, hardening some of our, the buildings on our campus. But if we cannot access the campus via roads to the village, then our actions will not help us all that much. So the results of this first round of cooperation have been critical in beginning to refine ideas that we have in mind for our own campus, as well as for starting the process to think through how the village and all of us will collectively need to act going forward. And I really would like to thank Hui for initiating this effort and the Woods Hole Group for their very informative analysis. Thanks very much and look forward to the question session. Great, thank you so much, Paul. That was really very helpful. It's a great perspective from, uh, from one of the key players in the village. Um, I'm gonna move on to Nicole. Cabana. All right, thank you, Leslie Ann. Um, I'm happy to be here to speak to all of you about the Northeast Fisheries Science Center and our perspective on this study. The Northeast Fisheries Science Center is part of NOAA Fisheries, and our mission is to provide productive and sustainable fisheries, safe sources of seafood, the conservation and recovery of protected species, and healthy ecosystems. Woods Hole is a very valuable location to us. We, are, we were the first scientific institution to establish in Woods Hole in 1871. We're also the first NOAA Fisheries Laboratory in the nation, and we continue to operate the nation's oldest marine aquarium. 
Today, the commercial fisheries we study contribute more than 14 billion to the GDP in our region annually. And we also have over 80,000 visitors to our aquarium annually. And the picture that's up on the screen right now shows the NOAA facility in the bottom left corner. And um, as you can see, we are uh, right there at sea level. Uh, but we are fortunate that we have a marine, uh, a wall, and uh, we have some protection. Right now we are not subject to sunny day flooding. Uh, so we are somewhat protected, but we're also very vulnerable as is the rest of the community and as this study shows. Um, just another note about our historical um, presence in Woods Hole is that in 2021, we will be celebrating 150 years in Woods Hole. So Woods Hole was chosen as the site of NOAA's first fisheries laboratory for the same reasons that Paul talked about why uh, Woods Hole was chosen by the Marine Biological Laboratory. Woods Hole sits at the boundary between two eco-regions providing access to the mix of species from the colder waters north of Cape Cod and the warmer waters south of Cape Cod. Today, the Northeast Fisheries Science Center is responsible for the fisheries and protected species from North Carolina to the main Canadian border, covering over 160,000 square miles of ocean. Our location in Woods Hole at the border between these two oceanographic ecoregions continues to enable us to best execute our mission. Th through the years, <coughs> excuse me, through the years, Woods Hole has grown and we greatly value our partnerships with the other Woods Hole science institutions. Woods Hole is one of the greatest marine science centers in the world, and that is because of all of our institutions being part of it. The study by the Woods Hole group revealed that our community is vulnerable it revealed that we're all going to be impacted. And we knew that already. All coastal communities everywhere are at risk. But until this study, we only knew about our vulnerability abstractly. We knew we were at risk someday, but we didn't know which of our buildings or which parts of our infrastructure were most at risk. And we didn't know about the risk throughout our community. So this study, has given us concrete information that we can make informed decisions with. It enables us to take actions to mitigate risks. The study has also shown that we are all in this together. This particular aerial photo of the Woods Hole Village makes that abundantly clear. We're all on the waterfront of this short, small little community, this short bit of waterfront, all very close to sea level, and we all chose to have our institutions here because of the unique access that it provides. And so NOAA doesn't own the risk in Woods Hole, nor does HUI, nor does MBL. We're all at risk and we're all in this together. I'm grateful that we have the study because now we have information that we can all work together to address our vulnerabilities. The Northeast Fisheries Science Center is committed to staying in Woods Hole and we're committed to working with our partner institutions and the community more broadly to address these risks and to ensure the, that Woods Hole remains a vibrant marine science community for generations to come. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much, Nicole. That perspective is wonderful and it adds beautifully to, to, um, to Paul's. I'm gonna um, go to the third leg of the stool third leg of the fourth leg of, of four stools, uh, four legs on this stool, and uh, ask Rob to, uh, to step in and, and give the HUI perspective. Yeah, thanks, Leslie Ann, um, uh, and, and good evening again, everybody. Uh, I've got some slides to show, and my, my thought is to uh, take a little bit different tact, which is to show a project that we have that's being uh, initiated uh, that uh, sort of suggests some ideas about how we might deal with this future that we've been hearing about tonight. And, and I could say virtually the same thing that both Paul and Nicole said about why we are here and the importance of it to our mission. Uh, so I won't belabor that. But here is, is, uh, is shown on this slide. So for those that aren't local, uh, where we are located on Cape Cod. Next slide. And the project I'm going to talk about is this, the Hui Waterfront Complex, which is shown outlined in yellow. Uh, and really, it's a, uh, I guess you, you might say it's a, an example. Of 
uh, an approach that might be taken uh, to uh, adapt and address the notion of sea level rise uh, through the next, through the rest of this century. Next slide, please. So we're a seagoing institution. Uh, this is our current waterfront, not too uh, long ago. It shows uh, our two large ships that we operate on behalf of the Navy tied up at our dock. And you can see it's a very active uh, waterfront facility. And the ship on the left is the RV Atlantis, mother ship of the Alvin. And the ship on the right is the uh, RV Neil Armstrong. And you can see the buildings uh, on the left-hand side of the dock facility, which is where uh, the action is supporting our ships, supporting our underwater vehicles, as well as laboratories for autonomous underwater vehicles, uh, oceanographic centers, sensors, and all manner of work that needs to happen to get our science and engineering to sea. So next slide, please. This picture just shows how busy the place is. Uh, it is an essential part of our, uh, of our mission. It's an essential part of the way we do business. It's how we get uh, out to sea. Uh, the upper left shows the Armstrong coming in uh, for an event. Upper right is a uh, near and dear to Leslie Ann's heart. It was the Entrepreneurs Forum where we hosted entrepreneurs from all over the country uh, and they were uh, to display their wares and that's the, uh, the uh, Atlantis tie up there. On the left we're bringing the Alvin into the uh, high bay in our facility there to uh, do a big major refit. And on the right, we're utilizing our test well uh, to test the autonomous underwater vehicle Sentry. Next slide, please. So the facility is 50 years old, and it has a actually 51 years old, and it has a 50-year design life, and it's uh, it needs to be replaced, and hence our our need to have this uh, project. And what we've entitled it is Seawater Complex for Waterfront Access to Exploration and Research. And I want to focus on two things the dock and the buildings that we're going to be uh, building uh, to redevelop our waterfront so that we can continue to do our business there uh, through the rest of this century. And so the dock and our key criteria are we want to build it to reflect what we know about sea level rise now and we want it to be adaptable sometime in the future so that this facility will have a, a design life upwards of 80 years through the rest of the century. So this is a, a three views of the dock and doesn't need to get super technical, but there we are looking at three concepts which we're honing in on making decisions shortly. The, the first one on the left is rebuild in kind what we have, which is essentially a concrete deck on top of piles. And uh, so that is a known uh, construction technique. It's obviously what we've lived with for the last 50 years and technology has improved so we uh, can probably design it to last even longer than that. But we, to, for it to be adaptable, we would essentially have to build a deck on a deck sometime in the future after we've experienced sea level rise. The center concept is a floating dock. So it's a, uh, and we call it hybrid because there'd be a portion that's fixed, uh, but there's also the main uh, aspect of it is floating. It could be built off site, built at a shipyard, uh, towed to site and then installed. It requires a lot fewer piles, but it also has some operational uh, disadvantages in that it, since it's floating, you have to have ramps from shore onto the dock to get access for all the activities that you're gonna have, including heavy machinery. Then on the right, we have a very innovative idea called a tension pile floating dock, which essentially uses a concept of floating, uh, but secures the float uh, under the water line at a fixed level. And then you build a deck on that that uh, is, well, has the look and feel of a, a fixed dock. And then in the future, you can adjust the height of that uh, floating portion that's underwater to address the sea level rise. So that's something that would adapt once or twice over the life of the facility rather than uh, continuously the way a floating dock would. So three very interesting designs, all adaptable. Each one has pros and cons. Next slide, please. So this is the site of our project. And uh, we also, because uh, several of the existing buildings are partly on the existing dock, we, we have a building project too once we uh, start the rebuild of the dock. And so we're looking closely at how do we develop a building uh, which would house the laboratories and the shops and all the activities that need to be on the water in a way that is uh, uh, anticipates sea level rise and is adaptable in the future. So next slide, please. And so looking at that, this is how we would uh, end up with a new building, which now is tucked behind Smith and Bigelow. So Smith and Bigelow are on Water Street, the same street that our, our uh, neighbor institutions are. And the new waterfront building, NWB, would be uh, located there. So it's now on dry land. Uh, so we've essentially enlarged the surface that we have of our, our, our operating deck. 
and it provides uh, us to, to be uh, able to implement one of the three dock designs that I showed on the previous slide. Next slide, please. So this is a cross section of that building, and uh, I think there's a, one or two key points. The, the building needs to be adaptable, just like the dock does. So it's new uh, height, deck height of the deck of the dock, as well as the building going into the uh, the high bay areas, such as where we put the Alvin, is actually going to be two and a half feet higher than it is now, and that's based on the, a lot of the work that Woods Hole Group has done, as well as uh, several other studies that we've commissioned. Uh, and the right half of, of the building is actually already built up four feet. Uh, so that uh, it would be anticipated to be able to handle uh, the sea level rise over the time period, the lifespan of the system. And the, the dock itself and the uh, high bay area would be able to be raised by a foot and a half as we experience sea level rise. So the notion here is an adaptable uh, concept that would allow us uh, to be responsive to sea level rise. Last slide, please. So notionally, here's the artist rendering of what this might look like. Uh, the building uh, sort of uh, tucked behind Smith and Bigelow, our new uh, dock area, and uh, our ability to operate uh, responding to sea level rise. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Leslie. Great. Thanks, Rob. It's, that's a, a great short case study of how we're trying to take uh, the information that we're receiving and the analyses and actually, uh, you know, produce a project based on it. So, um, and um, like to turn it over um, again, last but not least, maybe we'll just say we leave the best for last, um, which is uh, Beth Colt. So Beth is with the Woods Hole Business Association and I want to introduce her. Good evening, Beth. Hi, thank you so much, Leslie Ann. Um, I think I will be the briefest of the speakers here tonight, but thank you so much for inviting me. Um, Woods Hole has a very robust and innovative business community and members of the Woods Hole Business Association have always benefited from their proximity to the science community and not just to sell them a popover or a t-shirt or a water view hotel room. Um, the symbiotic nature of this relationship is really going to intensify in this time of change. And we're gonna need each other more than ever as we seek to work together for solutions. Um, you know, there are thousands, possibly tens of thousands of seaside villages uh, who will ultimately be affected by climate change and sea level rise. And certainly the Woods Hole Business Association is incredibly grateful to be surrounded by this uh, amazing science community who's going to think in innovative ways about what our solutions are. Um, I was really, you know, inspired by everything I heard tonight. Um, and I think that the business community is always inspired by the science community here in Woods Hole. Um, it really pushes the local businesses to be on the top of their game um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And then I would just also say that I think innovation is really power. And I, my takeaway from Kirk's comments were the solutions he put forward to protect, to migrate, to transform. Those are really interesting ideas, all of them. And I would say that the business community has faced those kinds of needs to innovate in a very intense way this year in the pandemic and has responded um, in, in incredible and innovative ways. So I, um, I listened to this with a lot of hope and excitement that we can work together to find solutions to what is a seriously intractable problem. Thank you. And we're just so glad that uh, we have such a great relationship with, you, with your organization and others in the area. Um, as you know, we have uh, established a community advisory committee um, and uh, engagement across folks who live there, work there, uh, recreate there, study there, um, visit there. I mean, it's very important to us. Um, we, are, we, are, we are all in this together. So. Um, we have a number of questions, so if we wouldn't mind um, maybe uh, spotlighting the whole panel, that would be great. Um, again, um, we have uh, the opportunity to submit questions through Q&A. Um, we're going to take questions uh, for about 10 minutes here and see um, if we want to go on the longer we can do that. I'm going to pitch the first question to Paul, um, just because I like to pick on him once in a while. But the question is, um, and I, I'm pitching it to you because this is you brought it up in your presentation, but um, anybody else can answer this. But have insurance industries indicated that they might reduce premiums if a community implements a sea level rise adaptation measures? Have you gotten any indication from your uh, insurers or, or anything uh, on that topic, Paul? 
So, you know, I don't, I, I don't know about the, uh, about the community level, um, which could be a substantially, you know, which could be a significantly different issue. When we look at things that we may be proposing to do uh, for our campus in terms of some engineering solutions, and some of those have been highlighted, in fact, by, which will be visible in the report that uh, from the Woods Hole Group, um, there's no indication yet that those things will actually have a have a major impact because I in, in part because I think you know there's a lot of experience that has to be developed here and there's just significant losses. You know the way I think about this is that um, you know we we have to pay for, we have to insure our property but we can only insure it to a certain amount and then we have to deal with the reality of a storm that may cause significant damage above and beyond what we could possibly insure. Um, I think you know the way I the way to think about insurance is if you think that there aren't really problems coming out there, um, this is a market indicator that there are, and it should uh, it should drive you to think about uh, addressing issues regardless of of how you know the actual insurance uh, process will work, and that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. Okay, thank you very much, and. Um, Another person wanted to know, I think this is for um, the three, well, actually for everybody. The question is, what does HUI, MBL, NOAA, and the business community see as the role of different levels of government in addressing their future challenges? So this is sort of taking, you know, panel one and turning it on its head and saying, okay, institutions, what do you think the roles of different levels of government should be? And uh, I guess, Nicole, we can maybe give you a pass on that since you are one of the levels of government, but you're welcome to chime in. But uh, Beth, Rob, Paul, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I guess maybe I'll start uh, just by saying that I, I think the, all levels have a, 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 a role to play in leadership, that they uh, really need to uh, help to uh, coalesce uh, communities to, to work together. Um, obviously, funding is really important. Uh, and at the federal level, the, you have more zeros. At the state level, you have fewer zeros. And at the local level, you probably have no zeros. Uh, I think um, Megan English Braga made an interesting point today that uh, when asked the same question, that really at the local level, uh, what they can do is help with the adaptation and the planning uh, and to try to get the community together so that there's at least some semblance of uh, agreement about what the right steps are to take. Uh, but as far as the, the dollars to do this, uh, you know, it cascades from, from federal on down. How about you, Beth? What do you, what's your thoughts on that question? Well, I think, you know, Woods Hole has long been, um, you know, a center uh, of, of, for visitors. And um, Nicole mentioned 80,000 people visit the aquarium, um, an extraordinarily larger number than that take the Steamship Authority boats every year, um, not to mention all the, um, you know, the science community that's living and working here. Um, so, you know, we are going to need the broader community to decide that Woods Hole is a jewel and a gem and that it's something that they want to preserve because they like to come visit here. I don't think that even with the powerful stakeholders that we have at the table, um, that we will in any way individually be able to afford what needs to happen. So there's going to need to be a collective decision that this is a place worth saving and, um, and that the money to do that will have to be corralled from all of the resources, from private funding to businesses to everywhere. Um, and so, but I think having the uh, having a roadmap to that and especially these maps and ideas about what comes first and how we might look at, you know, where we want to protect and where we might say not worth protecting. Those are hard decisions, but they need to be talked about and made if we're going to have a plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a really good, really good response. It is a uh, there are definitely different nooks and crannies in our community that are owned and, and have different jurisdictions and different levels of feed into money and regulations. And it's important that we're all moving in the same direction, flowing down the river together, right? Um, okay. Wow. I mean, there's one other thing I just might add there, and that's the, from a local perspective uh, and a safe perspective, I suppose, but there's, there's you know, zoning laws, regulatory uh, guidelines, and, and there are Lots that would, you know, while now they may be, um, you know, uh, in the 
relative order of priority, when you look at it from a sea level rise perspective, some things might become less important than they are now or perceived to be now in terms of the decisions you have to make. So there's going to be a lot of trade-offs and uh, you know, that uh, regulatory approach and zoning approach, I think is going to be a very uh, complicated, but important uh, one that really needs the community to be able to work together on. Yeah, and I, just just to make one point on that, I mean, I think government at both the, you know, particularly at the local and state level can help enable, can help fund, um, can help leverage sources of, uh, of funding to help help us do this. I think if you if if you if you go if you're completely reductionist and you say that every single entity that's ex that exists along the coast is going to fund itself by itself, that is going to be a vastly less effective and efficient way to think about the problem uh, than a collective approach um, that, you know, takes this kind of planning and, and looks for, you know, potentially more effective and efficient ways to get this done. And I think that also plays into what Rob was uh, just saying about, you know, zoning and those other issues. So I, I don't think, you know, it doesn't make sense for every single entity owner, um, whatever, along the coast by themselves to try to deal with this is a non, it's a non feasible problem. But I think collectively, it is a it is a problem that can be addressed. And the role of governments at various levels sort to help enable that and in some cases help fund that. Mm -hmm. Nicole, do you do you agree? Yes, I do. I think this is very much a community uh, level need. And it's going to take the involvement of all of the levels of government uh, in order to really address this problem. And I'm grateful that we, that all of the Woods Hole Science Institutions work so closely together because I think collectively we're able to really kind of show our community how important we are and what that will be effective in communicating at all levels of government to get the funding needed to address this as well. Yeah. When, and that leads into another question that was asked, which I think we sort of covered, but uh, are there legal and or policy impediments to implementing the proposals? And um, does our study come out with any recommendations for zoning changes? Um, Rob, you want to take that or? Uh, I really think we just covered that for the most part. Um, I think the answer is obviously yes, that there are going to have to be changes uh, uh, along that whole spectrum in order to accommodate the types of things we're talking about. And I think it goes back to the original point that I brought up, which is the fact that we have to make value judgments about what are the most important things uh, when it comes to those types of determinations. Um, and some things that uh, uh, right now are viewed as really high priorities might have to become less so if, if uh, you know, your ability to continue to function is really the, the, uh, the alternative. Mm -hmm. I think um, all of our institutions are in the, uh, the research uh, space, we're in the discovery space, we're in the exploration space. We, we like, to, like to take very difficult problems and try to answer them or difficult situations and try to make them better. Um, and I think we all are very cognizant of the need to lead by example. Um, and so on that frame, the question that comes in, are the technologies or solutions for adaptation as presented today ready to go? And is there an opportunity for Woods Hole to export tech or a technology to coastal regions globally. That's sort of, you know, are we going to learn from what we're doing and, and, and how are we planning on sharing that? And, and, and many of you don't know, but uh, this panel, some folks on this panel are actually going to be sharing our experience on this study uh, and on our plans um, at a nationally recognized conference called Restore America's Estuaries on October 1st. Um, we not only have our three institutions represented, but we'll also have our seawater uh, technical experts joining us on how we're looking at leading by example and bringing some of these adaptation techniques and innovative techniques uh, to our case study in Woods Hole. So we feel like we are leading by example, um, but does anybody else have any other thoughts on that question? Only thing I would say is that sometimes it's um, better. I mean, we want, I think we want to lead in terms of our collaborative efforts. But when it comes to engineering solutions, we also want to follow. Others will innovate around us, and we have to be good listeners and make sure that um, things that are experimented with in you know, far-flung places uh, get looked at closely so that we don't you know, narrow ourselves just to the solutions we might come up with on our own. That's a great point. Well, the reason I, uh, I 
to, to kind of build on what Beth just said, the reason I showed those three examples of docs, not to dive into the technical details, was to show kind of a spectrum from low risk, well understood, but maybe not as innovative relative to where we want to get to, to very maybe higher risk, but one that uh, has all the adaptability capability. And, and one of the things we've done with those is to share them with a external uh, subject matter experts, including uh, from, uh, from the Netherlands in order to get the types of, to see where do those things fit in with the rest of the world. Because, you know, while Woods Hole is, you know, we're, we're, we're this wonderful community, we, we, there's a whole world out there of, of the way things are done and we don't want to have any stone unturned and, and maybe we'll find a solution or maybe we'll get one validated that we right now think is risky that we can move into the less risky category that's really going to help address it. And then, and then we are leading. Uh, but I, I also think it's important that, you know, this session and, and the communications that we're going to continue to have on this topic are, are another method that we want to do to continue to engage so that we have these conversations, we get feedback, uh, we learn, uh, and, and, uh, and we move forward. And I, yeah, I would just say, um, you know, from from my from the pers my perspective, that we're sort of uh, at the MBO, we're sort of at the conceptual stage now for how we might uh, address some of these issues. We have some, you know, I as I said, you know, for w one of our buildings, we now have a conceptual uh, uh, study design actually for how we would, among other things, harden that building by trying to get the but by, by in fact getting all of the critical building systems up out of the out of the floodwater area. Um, but you know that those are expensive approaches um, if, you, if, you, if you haven't already designed that into your, your buildings to begin with. So there are other things that we can think about and that we have begun to think about. And from my perspective, this this particular effort has um, crystallized some uh, some ways of, of sort of conceptualizing where we're going to go forward. And now we, we basically have some work to do to kind of think about how those will all hang together for us. That, that's, that's really important to know. Yeah, Beth, do you, um, do you, can you express what the business community in the local area is feeling? I mean, how, how do you feel about this? <laughs> well, I mean, I think people are certainly well aware. I mean, uh, people have been aware for some time that the, tides are rising. I think those of us who live close to the water can see the difference where we can see it in the beaches and the marshes and the places that we're familiar with. Um, those of us of, of any age at all notice how different it is. Um, and so I think, you know, the certainly the Woods Hole business community takes a lot of comfort in the fact that we're interwoven with this sophisticated world of international science, where, where you guys are attending conferences and uh, traveling the globe and bringing back amazing ideas. Um, I, you know, I feel like from our perspective, you know, if we keep feeding you good food, maybe you'll help um, save us from ourselves. So, uh, and I, I say that as, you know, lightly, but I, I do mean, I do feel that the, certainly that the business community um, does have a, a lot of confidence in, um, in our partners and friends in, in the laboratories that surround us. And uh, we're, I think we're hopeful that together we could figure something out that really works for Woods Hole and could be a template for a lot of other communities. That's great. We're really, really excited about the partnership. Um, so speaking of the next generation, I'm just gonna combine two questions and they're a com combination of, uh, of uh, environmental justice, uh, socioeconomic status, diversity, and, and educating the next, um, next chapter of, of young people. So there's two questions and I'll read them both and see if you have any response to them, but um, all three institutions have education as a part of their mission. What role do they see in educating the public, especially young people about adaptation and resiliency here and around the world in the face of rising sea level? And related to that is what kind of engagement process do we envision uh, after this report for people of color and at the bottom of our socioeconomic system and also, are you recruiting more young STEM scientists to be engaged in this research and outreach endeavor? It's a big one. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll um, let me uh, take a first crack at both of those. Um, so, you know, 
one of the one of the hallmarks of the uh, of the MBL is is the, our educational reach um, with the with the wide range of programs we do. And just as as an example on the climate change, our um, ecosystem center, which I mentioned, uh, has this uh, long term ecological research station um, at Plum Island, which has been looking at this, and also for that matter, up in Alaska. But the, but a big component of what they you know one of the components of what they do is their outreach to the local communities to inform them about the kinds of things that are going on, um, both 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 to inform but also to encourage folks to um, consider being part of this sort of grand um, this grand effort that we call science, um, and you know. Um, the other, the other, the, on the on the issue of of diversity, um, you know, this uh, as as some of you on this uh, in this meeting may know that there's a, a, a substantial effort by the by the local institutions um, to try to begin to address that issue. We are well well aware uh, of where we stand um, in terms of diversity in this particular area and the challenges we face. And, and it's actually a great point that I think the you know the the question if I'm if I'm understanding it right that some some people who are come up through uh, the STEM uh, you know come up with the STEM education but have come from a perspective of seeing uh, the impact of 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 environmental uh, situations that may be not climate related but are other related may bring an interesting. Uh, perspective to this, and, and uh, that's that's actually something I will tell you I hadn't really thought of, and uh, so I don't know who asked that question, but mm -hmm. I think that was uh, that certainly has caught my attention when you uh, raised that out. So I think that's a that's a that's actually a very good thought there. Well, thanks for for taking it on, Nicola, Rob, or Beth. Do you have any thoughts on those? I do. I think with our Woods Hole Aquarium, we have a wonderful opportunity to reach people and teach people about what we, the Northeast Fishery Science Center, is doing. And uh, we study the ecosystems in our region and we are seeing shifts because of changing um, ocean temperatures. And so I think if, as a community, we embark on some substantial sea level rise mitigations, we could absolutely have a part of the aquarium devoted to that. We've also talked about having a Woods Hole Welcome Center that all of our institutions would be a part of. And uh, if we're able to get that up and running, I think this could be a significant story that we could share with the community and visitors to the community. And then as far as the diversity and inclusion question, that one was quite complex. Um, I would say that the Northeast Fisheries Science Center is actively um, addressing diversity and inclusion within our workforce and NOAA is as a whole. Um, one of the things that we all six of our Woods Hole Science Institutions works together on is our partnership education program. That's a wonderful internship program that targets students from um, racial minorities and offers wonderful opportunities for them to engage with the world-class scientists that we have at each of our institutions. And by uh, bringing the students through that program, we're building a pipeline of talent. And now in NOAA, we have a few um, special hiring authorities that we're able to use to be able to target that specific pipeline and bring more of those students back into our community as workers. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Maybe I could just add uh, a couple of a couple of points uh, on on the latter. I, I, both Nicole and Paul have made reference to the organizations of uh, the institutions, you know, collaborating on the diversity question in Woods Hole. We all recognize it's a, a place for a lot of improvement. Uh, and and at, at Hui, we are establishing the office an officer of diversity, uh, and that position is going to be uh, put in place sometime in 2021. So we're taking uh, you know, specific action to try to improve uh, you know where we are in that in that question and and with respect to uh, how do we educate the public and how do we excite the next generation which I think can also be a part of the solution for the diversity question um, our new facility is planned to have a, a significant public space which we hope will uh, be able to showcase what happens at Hui and provide an exciting environment for people to learn and get excited about science and, and stem in general 
So uh, I think that'll be a feature that we have nothing like it now at, at HUI, and uh, it's gonna be an important part of our new facility. Well, that's great. Well, to round out the panel and turn it back over to Rob to close out the event, I wanted to get a thumbs up, a thumbs uh, neutral or a thumbs down. Are we staying? We're staying in Woods Hole, right? <laughs> all right, we've got a lot of work ahead of us and we're so excited to work together with you all on it. Um, and thank you all for participating uh, in the panel. Um, and uh, folks will be available um, after the event uh, via email and um, other ways of getting in contact with us if you have further questions. I know there's a number of questions I didn't get to tonight um, and I don't want you to think that they weren't important to us. Uh, we're just time limited and um, I think the conversation is going to continue and maybe we'll just do this again. Let's, let's come back together in six months or a year and see, see how we are, what we're doing, what, what progress we've made. So thanks again to Beth, Paul, Rob, and Nicole. It's been great uh, being your MC for this panel. And Rob, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, just a few closing remarks. I, I really want to say thanks to Nicole and Paul and their organizations for the partnership that we've created. And I think this is a uh, a good evidence of that, uh, that the report that we commissioned Woods Hole Group to do is incredibly important and informative. And uh, so I see this as just really sort of a first step in a long uh, series of, uh, of collaborations on, on this topic and, and on, on lots of other topics. And Beth, I also appreciate your perspective and, uh, and the leadership you provide for both the business community and, and as a resident. In fact, I was almost going to ask you a question, what you're going to do about your house, because Beth lives right on the water there in Woods Hole as well. And I also think it's important to recognize the uh, Massachusetts Seaport Economic Council, which provided funding uh, for some of this work. Uh, and we did that in partnership with the town of Falmouth. So uh, that's a really important um, aspect of this to show both the uh, state support and the, and the local support for this initiative. And also a lot goes on behind the scenes to make these types of events uh, possible. So I really want to give a shout out to the HUI communications team for the production tonight. So a couple of closing comments. Uh, this is in a unique, uh, incredibly unique place with fantastic attributes, geography, intellectual horsepower, uh, passion, and community. And, and besides the enormity of this challenge, uh, sea, sea level rise is really an, an opportunity of sorts, and, and it's obviously an obligation for this community to lead on, on this important issue of our time. And timescales are short. We're already experiencing the effects, and uh, the institutions have been around for 90 plus years, and so our time horizons uh, are certainly consistent with uh, the sea level rise projections that Kirk was presenting to us. So. Uh, we have to really get to work on this. And obviously it's important to look at our priorities and determine how we get there uh, and make some tough choices. So thanks a lot. I really appreciate everybody's uh, attendance tonight and uh, we hope to uh, see you again at another event. And this will be recorded. And so if uh, folks wanna re review it again or share it with your friends, uh, you can get that from the HUI website. Thanks and good night.